Anybody that's ever owned a home will tell you one problem you don't like to find is something wrong with your foundation. The signs can be cracked or deteriorating walls, uneven floors, and sticking windows and doors. When these things start to reveal themselves, what should you do about it? My guest today is Bob Brown. He's a speaker, patented innovator, the foremost authority on foundation repair diagnosis, and the author of the book Foundation Repair Secrets, Learn How to Protect Yourself and Save Thousands. Before you start over-Googling to figure out what's wrong, you need to hear what Bob has to say. I'm George Siegel, and this is Homeowners Be Aware, the podcast that teaches you everything you need to know about being a homeowner. Bob, thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. Now, a foundation of a house is something that most people probably take for granted, and I imagine it depends on what part of the country you True. live in and the foundation challenges. So overall, tell us how important, I mean, it, it sounds obvious just in the name, it's the foundation. How important is that to a house? Uh, well, I mean, if your foundation is not right, the rest of your house won't function properly. Your doors and windows won't work. You'll get cracks in your walls. You can even get looks, uh, leaks in your roof. So it's important that your foundation operate optimally. Now, when I'm going around my neighborhood, I live in Florida, I live in Tampa, and you see them put the base there, they pound away on it for several days, put all the pipes in, and then they pour the foundation. Um, is, is it done differently in different parts of the country? T tell us what, what like for each, I know you can't describe all 50 states, but is there an, a general way to do it versus yes. uh, an unusual way? Yes, so uh, uh, in the colder climates, you're gonna see more crawl spaces and more basements. And, and the reason you see more basements up north is because you have a frost depth and you need to dig down to your footings for frost depths. And sometimes that can be quite deep. You know, it could be three feet or so or, or more. And if you're digging down that far, it's not that much farther to keep digging for a basement. And, and so uh, quite often uh, you'll see up north uh, 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 basements and quite often kind of in the mid range or even even up north, you'll further you'll see more crawl spaces than slabs on a grade. Now, here in Florida, there's a lot of elevated houses. There's houses on stilts. Right. So, what would you consider the foundation? The base where the ground is, where the right. the the, the, the pylons go into the ground, or the elevation where the first floor starts? Uh, down in the ground, it's called a deep foundation system, and uh, can be installed in a variety of ways. Uh, but uh, piles and, and, and piers and all kinds of things that, to go in and install a deep basement system, uh, or sorry, a deep foundation system. Uh, and uh, they'll extend up and then they'll have a floor structure. So a lot of people get mixed up between the floor and the basement. And a lot of, especially with slabs on grade, they think that the slab is part of the basement when in fact it's not, it's, it's the floor slab. Now, sometimes with a post-tension slab, it's kind of the same thing, but not always, usually not. So just, just to dumb it down for me, because I get so easily confused. So the foundation would be the very bottom level. Right. That's where that the foundation is support the structural loads. So then what are we looking at in terms of most people aren't involved in that part of the process. You know, even if you're buying new construction, they don't really want you out there until they're they're pretty far <laughs> along. So how do you right. keep an eye on that? How do you know if it's being done right? You know, I, I will tell you that um, there's probably no way for a lay person to really know whether it's being done right, except maybe very obvious. Like I've seen like them pouring concrete right after a real heavy rain and there's mud down in the footings or something, you know. Uh, but but most of the time, uh, it gets built properly, and and the, the foundations. The reason for foundation problems is not necessarily the construction; it's rather the soil. And the soil is complicated and unpredictable, and uh, over time it changes, and that's what the foundation sits on. And it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, you could have a a, a foundation made out of solid titanium. And it's still floating on the soil, right? So it could still have problems. Now, I had an arborist out to my house recently. We have a big grand oak in front of the house. And he was saying that a lot of houses, the trees around it cause problems for foundations. How conscious True. do you have to be of the trees around you? That's right. Tree, trees can cause a problem in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of them is obviously if the tree's real close, 
the roots uh, can 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 interfere with the footing. And I've seen uh, roots break up footings and 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 uh, cause like a peak in the floor slab and uh, crack walls. I've seen that happen. But the other way that people don't quite think of a lot is the fact that in areas where you have clay soils, clay soils expand. They, they call them expansive soils, right? Everybody's heard of expansive soils, but they don't really understand what they mean. What they mean is if you have clay soil that's expansive, uh, then when it gets wet, it swells. And when it gets dry, it shrinks up. And so those changes in equilibrium is what causes the problems, not necessarily the, the initial makeup. Well, if you've got soil around the house that's in equilibrium and you've got a giant tree sucking out moisture in one part of the house, those soils are going to shrink more than the others and you're going to cause settlement. And that happens quite often in areas with expansive clay soils. Now, I, I follow a number of uh, home inspectors on Instagram and they show me pictures of I saw one recently where they were pouring the foundation and there was a big plastic cup that was on the ground. So when the cup was pulled away, there was now an opening in the foundation. Now he said, structurally, that's probably not going to affect it. But it, is it just give you an indication of how sloppy they might have been when they were doing the project? Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, we're dealing with construction workers that um, quite often make a lot of mistakes, uh, are not uh, not educated properly. And uh let's face it, you know, every, every industry has a shortage of, of properly trained people and construction is really, really having a struggle right now. You, you just can't find people. I mean, I sold my company last year, but it was a super structure. Uh, I mean, a super hard thing to just to find uh, guys to, you know, basic guys just to work, you know, we'll train them. Uh, even then we couldn't find them. And we quit. We quit recruiting from the construction industry because <laughs> there was just nobody to recruit from. We just wanted to find guys that wanted to work hard, right? And and uh, trained them ourselves. Now, sometimes you see a foundation poured, and it sits there for a couple of weeks, and then sometimes they start building on it right away. Is there a certain cure period that's needed to to properly let a foundation uh, take hold? Well, concrete. Uh, uh, cures on an asymptotic scale. Uh, it starts out curing very quickly, but it doesn't happen right away. It takes 28 days to reach uh, 90, whatever it is, 95% of its strength, I think. It takes seven days to reach two thirds of its strength. And it's only half, half strong after maybe a day or two uh, or three. Uh, so it does take time for concrete to, uh, to, to cure up. However, you know, depending on the foundation type, they'll go in and, and if it's a post-tension slab, they'll go in and, and um, tighten up the cables and, and, and tension the cables after, I think, three days. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, you start framing a house, you know, the wood doesn't really weigh that much, right? It doesn't, you don't get a lot of weight on the foundation until they start putting the roof tiles on top of the roof. And you'll see them do that They'll get the house uh, 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 singles, shingles, and they'll they'll just set them up there. They won't necessarily lay them out. They'll just set them up there, and that's to weight the house, and that's a lot of weight. And they want it to kind of move and settle because all homes settle during construction, right? Uh, and they settle the most when you put that weight up on the roof, or and so then most of the time they'll get that up there and they'll put the put the tiles on, and then they'll wait to have a little bit of settlement a couple of weeks or something like that and then they'll do the drywall because if they don't then the drywall starts cracking right away and then they have to fix it right so that's not a that's not a good plan now does it make a difference if it's a block house because a lot of the houses here are first floor block and then and, and quite often well not enough but a lot of them are second floor block also block is quite a bit heavier than wood so yeah you might you might have a little longer waiting period for block that's that's uh true i didn't think about that but uh and uh, typically when you put the block in, the block's not that heavy. Well, it is heavy, but what's heavier is the grouting of the cells uh, with concrete and rebar in there. That that it contributes a lot of weight. And, and it's not just a little bit. I mean, it should be, you know, every 32 to 40 inches on center vertically and then horizontally every four feet to have what they call a bond beam. And all that concrete 
uh, ways when you start putting it in the block in the cells. So if I'm buying an existing house, do I want a foundation inspection or should my home inspector be able to see the signs of a foundation that has problems? Uh, I, I do the training for the uh, uh, American Society of, of Home Inspectors here in Phoenix. Ashy, they call it, right? And uh, I mean, I'll train them to know what to look for, but they don't really have the skills. They don't really have the skills to uh, uh, like diagnose whether it's heave or settlement or whether you need peers or how bad it is. That that re really should require an engineer. And by the way, it should never be done by a foundation repair contractor, even though they do it more, more than anybody else. We'll talk about that when you get the chance, but should be done by a licensed professional engineer. Now, the problem with, with real estate transactions is that you know, you have a 10-day inspection window and the home inspector goes in and they might see a problem, right? Well, then they get the report and they turn it in like two days before the end of the the the, the window, the inspection window. And so then the, the, in a panic, the realtor reaches out to try to find somebody. And it, and, and the first thing they do is they Google and, and, and who comes up, the foundation repair companies. They call a foundation repair company and it's like, hey, can you give me a report in two days, you know? Oh, well, I mean, a foundation repair contractor will go out there and give them an estimate maybe in two days, but that's not really a foundation investigation. And there's no way an engineer can get it done in two days. It's just physically impossible. Might be able to get it done in 10 days if they really have nothing on their backlog and they can really uh, do it fast. But uh, I encourage most realtors to put a clause in their contract that says, hey, if, if, if a foundation a problem is uh, identified, then we need another 10 day window to get a, an expert in here to give us an assessment. And what usually happens, unfortunately, is the, uh, they call a foundation repair contractor who wants to sell a big job and he shows up and says, hey, you need $80,000 in peers. Well, guess what happens to the listing? The whole thing blows up and everybody goes their separate ways, right? That's what usually happens. Now, you know, there's so many things that when you're buying a house that you have to think about. And I can honestly say that in, in all the houses that I've bought, I've never well, had to or thought of bringing in a foundation person. I've usually just relied on the inspector calling something out as an alert. Now, the way you're explaining this, it sounds like that's a, a, a missing link, much like I think a lot of people need to maybe bring an insurance agent with them to find out if the house is insurable. Um you know, there's things we just miss that we end up paying for later. Right. Yeah. And, and you might you might not have to like bring the, the, the insurance guy out, but you can check it for claims, right? They can do that online. Um, it's a little more difficult for a foundation inspection. You really need to have eyes on it, right? You need to, you know, do a full inspection and it needs to be done really by a licensed professional engineer. Uh, and... Uh, not just any old engineer, by the way, it needs to be a forensic, uh, I prefer geotechnical engineer. And the reason I prefer geotechnical is because a structure, everybody calls a structural engineer, really the wrong guy to call. Uh, and the reason is, is because they'll call him out and he'll say, oh, okay, there's no structural deficiencies. Okay, well, could it become a structural deficiency? Oh yeah, if it keeps moving, it could be a structural deficiency. Well, is it gonna quit, is it gonna keep moving? Well, uh, you need to call a geotechnical engineer because it's a soil problem. So you just wasted all your time and effort calling a structural engineer uh, when you should have just called a geotech in the first place. A forensic geotech, not a regular geotech. Most, most, most engineers work in new construction and they work in things like uh, infrastructure, freeways, dams, sewer systems, water systems, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, maybe, maybe new buildings, right? Uh, and very few work in residential, and even fewer do forensic work. And those are the guys you need to call out. So what are we looking at cost-wise for that? Because, you know, most people bitch if they're going to pay four or $500 for an inspection, and then they're told, well, maybe yeah. you need to get a termite inspection. Now you got to get an AC guy out here. So yeah. where do you fit into the equation? Well, I don't. I'm not a... I'm, I'm, I'm well, not you're, a you're what you're talking about, though. <laughs> I'm not saying... I'm not expecting you to show up at my house. You sold your business, but... yeah. 
Well, and I had a I had a forensic engineering business and a foundation repair business. So I, I understand both parts of it. And you're right. I mean, that is a problem for a buyer, right? Because a lot of engineers will charge three thousand dollars. Now I'm trying to I'm trying to build a group of engineers and give them the tools to be able to produce it for less than a thousand. But uh, that's a bit of work. I I I, I get it. But uh, that's my mission in life. I'm trying to help the public by by giving engineers tools to to make them more efficient so that they can compete with free, which is what you get with the foundation repair company. Yeah, uh, I, I just don't, I, I can't get my head around seeing how anybody buying a house, especially if it's in that 500,000 to a million or, or whatever, nobody's going to pay for that. I, I totally agree. You know, and, and, and it's the, it's, it's, it's a problem. It really should be on the, on, on the listing, on, on the selling agents end to be proactive, to know good experts and to bring them in before they even list the house and say, Hey, you know, do an inspection, give us a clean bill of health or else tell us what needs to be done and then supervise it and inspect it so that you can give us a clean bill of health when it's done. And uh, that's the way it should be done. And a lot of times what happens instead is, you know, they call the foundation repair company who gives them a giant bill to repair the, to repair the foundation. Everybody goes their separate ways. The, the, the seller fires the, the listing agent does cosmetic repairs, hides it, finds a new listing agent and puts it up for sale. And then if it's a continuing problem, somebody finds out about it three years down the road, right? Um, that's what happens most of the time. Yeah. Disclosure laws are so weak in so many jurisdictions around the country that it's like playing hot potato. So it, yeah. it almost seems like that should be something that if you're looking at a house, maybe you insist that the homeowner stand behind the foundation right? because that shouldn't be your problem. If they're living on a decaying property, it shouldn't become your problem. And, and it's like, as we talked about, it's, it's very difficult for, a, I mean, think about it. A, 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 a guy that's interested in the house that not even sure he's going to buy it, right. Is going to spend a grand uh checking it out when he might might not even buy it i mean it's not very tenable my my hope is that someday that uh, a foundation inspection uh with uh topo lines and and the history and the damage maps and all the things that are required in a proper report be done on every transaction or prior to within you know a certain amount of time prior to uh so that there's a record of of the history some like a like a um carfax a yeah like carfax yeah uh something like that so that uh it's it's transparent and everybody knows what they're getting into absolutely i think every house should be tagged by that and i know that's unfortunate for somebody who's got a problem house but you know that's like a store selling something with a stain on it and they just hide it you know it shouldn't become right. the buyer's problem and we just kick it down the road you know and and it just seems to happen way too often. I know here in Florida, we also have sinkholes. Right. I would imagine that there's no foundation that's going to save you from that, is there? Nope. You got a sinkhole, the whole house will fall in <laughs> or part of it or whatever. Yeah. There's no yeah. stopping it. Yeah. You can't even get uh, an insurance isn't paying for it. They've, they've now yeah, they realized. Used to. They know. used to in Florida, but they quit doing it. Yeah. Like a lot of things they've quit doing here, but that's they're probably right. going, Hey, that's a money loser. Let's stop paying for that. It's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just see it as a real challenge. I mean, I see the importance of it. It's just like getting a geological study of your, of your property. I think it's easier when, when it's a brand new house, because the builder, at least for a certain period of time has to stand behind that right. foundation. So once I have the house and it's in my possession, what should I be looking for? Or even if I'm looking at a house and haven't bought it yet, so make me my own little junior foundation expert here. What are some yeah. things I can look for? Well, observationally, you're going to notice if you've got foundation problems, you're going to notice cracks in your walls, typically interior walls, exterior walls, maybe, but exterior is not climate controlled. It can track, crack for a lot of reason. Now block, stair step cracks, you'll see, you know, and that's pretty obvious, but stucco over, over wood frame, eh, cracks for a lot of reasons. Interior drywall, yeah, you'll notice it right away. Doors and windows that are out of square, kind of pinched, maybe uh, a, a larger gap on one side of the door and pinched on the other side. It doesn't operate very good. Yeah, 
Windows, same thing, right? Sloped floors. Those are the things that you're going to notice. Now, do you see in areas where, um, gosh, in, in Arizona, you have it probably with a long period where you go without rain. But what about areas where they have flooding and they have water problems? Um, that probably causes a whole different set of issues for foundations. It might, but the but the bigger problem is expansive soils. And some areas have them and some areas don't. And and expansive soils are cyclical. They may go up and down and up and down and, and all that moving uh, eventually causes problems. Now, do you have, you know, if you, if you have an area with giant flooding, that's going to be obvious. You know, you could have scouring, you could have uh, water that goes into down to layers where there are expansive soils that maybe don't, typically don't get wet, right? So you can have those kinds of problems as well. Moisture is always the catalyst, always is. And changes in moisture is what causes the problems, not necessarily moisture. So, you know, if you're under a constant flood all the time, if you're wet all the time, like Louisiana is wet all the time, well, it's going to be what it's going to be. But like Texas, on the other hand, Texas, you know, you, you, you have dry seasons and you have wet seasons and you've got expansive soil. That's why there's so many foundation contractors and so many foundation problems in Texas because of that combination. Now, I've had home inspectors tell me that um, you need to really watch the grading around your foundation. Right. You want to make sure that it's sloping away from it, not towards it. How 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 on top of that do people need to be? Super on top of it. I mean, uh, most of the time when you get uh, a, a report from an engineer, almost every report says fix the grading and drainage, and then nobody does it, right? <laughs> and then they wonder why they have problems. So it really is important. And, and, and quite often on modern houses, there's no way to make uh, surface grading work. I mean, you're supposed to slope six inches over 10 feet. Well, you got a five foot side yard. How's that work? Well, then, then, you, have to, then you have to provide, theoretically by code anyway, a, slope, a certain slope, 2% slope out to the street. Well, there's no elevation difference between the, the house and the street to get enough water to go out there. Uh, so so really, the only the only way to really make it work is to put gutters with hard pipe drainage to get the water 20 feet away from the house. Uh, and almost no builder does that, right? Well, I don't know any builders that do it unless it's a custom home. But uh, those are the things you need to do. To you, You'll get that recommendation almost all the time from engineers. And I'll just save you the short work. Just do it now. You don't wait for the engineer, right? <laughs> I, yeah, true. And I bet a lot of builders just put that into the ground, but it doesn't go anywhere just to make well, it look like. I've seen some boneheaded things like they 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 put uh, gutters and the, and, the, and the hard pipes are perforated. So it just ejects all the water right out of the house. That's the worst thing you could do. And I've seen that happen. Yeah. Another thing, I, I, I bet a lot of people learn this the hard way. If you have a tile roof and you have gutters and it's raining, the, the gutters are really worthless at that point because the water just comes shooting off the roof and, and lands all over your yard anyway. Well, we have a lot of tile roofs in Arizona. And so the gutter companies have learned to put bigger gutters on that, that catches most of that. Uh, but it is a challenge and especially at the corners and you can put up a little higher like you know, corner thing to catch extra water where the water comes down in a hurry, right? There's things you can do. You're never going to catch it all, right? I mean, it's impossible. You can't catch all the water coming out of the sky right next to the house. So how's that work? You know, <laughs> the, the, the goal is, you know, get as much of it as you can, right? So when you're at a party, do people come up to you and say, are you the dirt whisperer? <laughs> I've had a lot of people ask me, that's for sure. <laughs> What's it like having a title like that? I think it's kind of cool to have a title. I, I like it. Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's fun. And, uh, you know, dirt is an interesting subject. I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, dirt is just one uh, homogeneous mass of brown underneath the house. When it's not that way at all. Dirt gets deposited in layers. And every layer is a little bit different, more different density, different uh, different uh, mineral content, different affinities for water, uh, you know, lots of different things. And, and each of those layers, they're not exactly parallel. They all kind of, you know, they were deposited by nature organically, right? And so some may be high, some may be low, and the builder may have cut into a few while he was, you know, or, or, or piled on top. 
dirt dirt can be really really complicated which is why you have geotechnical engineers right yeah you know years ago a buddy of mine good friend of mine kept me waiting in a bar two hours while he was late and when he showed up he goes yeah i was with the dirt man he was a construction <laughs> guy and at the time i rolled my eyes like the dirt man i think it could be pretty fascinating hanging out with the dirt man now yeah lots of fun things with soil i i do a lot of hiking with a geotechnical engineer and you know, we're always talking about this natural process and rocks and ooh, look at this one and all kinds of stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I love that stuff now. I wish I wish I'd cared more about it when I was younger. Now, uh, tell me about the book. So I wrote the book. Uh, well, it's taken me about five years to write it, but uh, it, it was essentially uh, started with the genesis of a lot uh, of just a lot of blogs that I, I I blogged about, and then I eventually took all those and and put them in order and created a book. But um, it, it's been a lot of fun. I'm considering another book at, at this point, uh, a follow on book. But um, uh, the book basically has two premises. Number one, uh, why you should never uh, call a foundation repair company to get diagnosis. You can call them for repairs. They're good at that. Uh, and then the second part of it is people forget about expansive soils and, and particularly in heave, they don't understand what heave is. And so I, I wanted to show that there was a solution for heave. Now, the reason that's important is because the, the traditional foundation repair industry sells these piling products and they, they ignore heave because they don't have a solution for it. So they don't train their sales guys. They don't do anything about heave because, uh, you know, they don't want to go home hungry and it just confuses things. They don't have the training to really understand it very well. So I wanted to show that there are tools for it and that it can be addressed. There's a couple of things I wanted to touch on um, in our remaining time, just because I think it, it's some things that could help people the most. And we might have covered a few of these already. Uh, five red flags that mean foundation issues to look out for when buying a new home, the five red flags? Well, we, we sort of discussed them already. Uh, cracks in walls, uh, sloping floors, maybe cracks in floors, uh, although floors crack, crack for a lot of reasons. Uh, doors and windows out of square and, and being aware of the geology of where you're at, uh, what the soils are like. And you can go onto the NCRS website and kind of get an idea about what the what the soils are in, in your particular uh, neighborhood they usually print maps and those kinds of things for people to understand and so those those are the key things that that you should should be aware of at least when walking through the house and i've had realtors say things like oh jay don't worry about that door that won't open or the crack right next to it those are just cosmetic and we're going to get that fixed Ugh, i can't believe a realtor would ever say that but they have <laughs> And that's kind of why I asked you the question again, because I've heard that from them. I, I've heard them, they look at you and go, oh, that's just normal settling. Yeah. What should I think when I hear that? You should think, oh boy, you are op opining and leaving yourself open for a giant lawsuit because realtors should never opine on the characterization of anything foundation related. Yeah. And it wasn't the, it wasn't the realtor. It was actually a builder that, that oh. said that to me. I go, why is that doing that? That's ah, just normal settling. <laughs> Well, builders are almost as bad as foundation repair companies. So, you know, they have a here in Arizona, they have a a a, 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 a ten year uh, or actually an eight year uh, statute of limitations, and if you discover it the eighth year, you get a ninth year. So, uh, during that period of time, uh, if you make enough noise, well, first, if you complain to the builder, he'll send out uh, you know a a, a, a a rep, you know who will come out and, and tell you that it's nothing, that it's normal. And then if it keeps happening, they'll send out, you know, if it's bad enough, they'll send out a, a drywall guy to patch all the cracks. And then if it keeps happening, he'll just keep doing that, keep sending out the drywall guy. And eventually, you know, you're either going to run out of gas or or you're going to lose, lose interest. Or if you complain hard enough, he'll send out his engineer. Well, the problem is it's the same engineer that designed the house. So what's the, you know, it's not like he's going to say, oh, yeah, we screwed up. <laughs> uh, he's not going to do that. He's going to protect the builder uh, because that's whose client is, right? And so he's not really a he's not really a, a, an independent engineer. Uh, he's biased. 
Uh, and so uh, you shouldn't really trust anything they say, to be honest with you. That's true. So the places I've inevitably seen cracks are in like crown molding. Is that from foundation problems? It can be. Uh, sometimes you'll see a gap underneath the floor and that's, you know, when the floor is dropping. Or if you see uh, like the crown molding where it kind of wobbles back and forth, you know, that's from the floor pushing on it what we call cramming, cramming the baseboard. And that is from the floor pushing upward. And that can be either from the settling going, uh, the footing going down settling or from the floor heaving up from expansive soils. Could be either one. Now, when you have problems um, with a foundation, can anything be fixed or is it, and, and is it usually not covered by insurance, right? So Correct. if I have them, you come out and you say, it's going to be $40,000 to fix your foundation. That's on me. It typically is. Now, there might be some exceptions. So so the, so the rule is uh, in, in, in the insurance industry that they don't they have what they call an earth movement exclusion, which means they don't cover problems that are caused by earth movement. But but if you can prove that it's a sudden and catastrophic loss from like a pipe break or something like that, then you have a fighting chance. And I say fighting chance because I've seen it about 50 percent of the time where uh, you can get a, 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 an engineering expert to testify that, yeah, the, the, the pipe broke is what caused this, and therefore insurance is liable, blah, 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 and they'll have to fight with the insurance company's engineers, which, which again, the insurance company's engineers are not independent either, because guess what? They're protecting the insurance company. They were hired by the insurance company. They're going to protect the insurance company. It's just the way it goes. Yeah. Now in Florida too, the our wonderful state legislature just lowered the amount of time you can sue your builder. You had 10 years you could go after them and they just reduced that to seven years. Do you think they were thinking about things like foundations and settling when they were doing something like that? Absolutely. It's almost always the complaints that come from a builder, almost always they're, they're either uh, waterproofing problems or they're foundation problems. And a lot of the waterproofing problems are related to foundation. So, yeah, uh, they were thinking about that. And, and unfortunately, they were influenced by the, the home builder industry, which has a significant lobby. I mean, most of them are traded on Wall Street. They got pretty big bucks, almost unlimited bucks, and they're going to lobby hard. And so that, but so normally taking those three years off, there was probably a thought in there like, we'll save a lot of money doing this. I don't think they just randomly right. chose that. That's exactly right. Well, that's unfortunately fact of life. Wow. Okay. So then, and I think the other thing, it, it's hard to find good people. And I know you say don't get out the yellow pages. So, what are the do's and don'ts when hiring a foundation expert? Well, uh, <laughs> we've alluded to one big one already. Never hire a foundation repair contractor to, to diagnose the problem. They, they, they're going to send out who? They're going to send out a foundation repair salesman who gets a hundred percent commission. He doesn't. They're not, they don't. Typically, they don't get paid any salary. Not any. I've never seen it in any of them, and I know a lot of them through a lot of different industries. They don't get paid salary at all. It's all hundred percent commission. So. If they don't find problems, guess what? They starve to death or they get fired, find a new job. Uh, so uh, they're, they're uh, extremely conflicted to begin with. And the second reason is they don't have the training. I mean, to be an engineer, to be a soil engineer or any other kind of engineer, you need to go to school for five years and have two years of uh, training under, you know, in the, in the, in the industry from, a, from an engineer you have to take two very difficult exams. So what does a foundation uh, repair salesman training get? He might get a couple of days training at a, at a, a, a training put on by the single source supplier on how to sell their products and how to recognize problems to sell their products, right? Uh, that's that's primarily what, what you get. And these guys are ultra confident. They puff up their chest and they say things like, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm smarter than engineers. You know, I'm way better than engineers. And my response to that is, well, you've probably been doing it wrong for 30 years, you know. Uh, and sure, they've, they've seen a lot of houses, but they just don't understand. They just don't understand 
you know, soil mechanics and structural load paths like an engineer would. And so they're just not qualified. Much as they much as they pretend to say that they are, they're not. I, I had lots of salesmen work for me. And I can tell you, and I've known a lot outside my company, that's just the MO that they have. And um that and it's just it's a problem. You should never never call a foundation repair company. Now, the problem is you Google it, guess who comes up? The foundation repair companies. Why? They have a lot of money into marketing and they're helped by their suppliers who are who are even more wealthy. And and I mean, like basement systems, they're a good company. I like basement systems. I, I know the owner. They're they're good guys, but they have a hundred people in their internet marketing division. A hundred people. How's a little old engineering firm going to compete with that? Right? It's very difficult. So you're yeah. going to find foundation repair companies. That's just that's just all there is to it. You have to dig and search. I'm in the process of putting a directory on my website. I hope to have it finished here in in, in a month or two. Uh, of of all the forensic engineers throughout the country, because I get that question asked to me a lot on on social media. Hey, I, I live in Alabama. I live in Minnesota. You know, I can't find anybody, you know, and I try to help people as much as I can. So you don't really want to call the repair company in until you have a report for them to work off of. Right. Right. I mean, think about it. You get you get one a foundation repair salesman who says, oh, you need 13 peers. Another one says, no, you need 14. And on the other side of the house, and the other one says, no, you need 25. And so who does the homeowner believe? Uh, they believe the guy that is that they're most comfortable with, which is what? The guy that's the best salesman. And usually the guy that's the best salesman is probably not the best engineering type. You know, the engineering types are detail oriented. They're the opposite of sales. And so uh, listening, you know, to the guy that's the best sales guy on which product, which plan is the best plan is ridiculous. It doesn't, It you know, homeowners aren't trained to understand that. What, what you need to do is get an engineer to tell you, oh, you need 14 piles Here's a plan. Go get three bids from three bidders, from three contractors, and get it done. Now the homeowner has confidence that, oh, yeah, this is the right plan, and it's it's going to be supervised, and it's going to be done right. And would you tell the homeowner then to hold their ground when these guys try to upsell them and yeah. say, oh, they said you needed 14. We think you need 18. You yeah. say, I have the report. When you're doing the bid, I want you to do what's in this report. That's, That's how right. I want you to fix my house. That's right. And and by the way, if you have qualms with what the report says, go call the engineer. Don't don't talk to me. I'm not the expert. Go call the engineer. If you, if you can convince the engineer that you need 18 instead of 14 peers, well, more power to you then. But but don't talk to me about it because I'm not an expert. Okay. So in a perfect world, just to to wrap this up, what would you want homeowners to be thinking about foundations? What should be in their mind? Not, not necessarily what you're looking for in the house, but how important in the process should this, the health of your foundation be? Well, all I know is it's expensive. And, and a lot of people have made the claim, and I've never been able to verify it, but I, a lot of people have made the claim that more foundations get damaged from earth movement than they do from uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, and fires combined. I've never been able to verify that statistic, but 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 it abounds a lot in the foundation industry. A lot of people say it. I have no idea whether it's true or not, but it could be. It's a it's a big problem. It doesn't make the news because it happens one house at a time. Yeah, it kind of makes it makes your own news circle or with, among all your friends when all of a sudden you find out you need fifty thousand dollars worth of foundation work to sell your house. Right, and and here's the problem that homeowners face. They're they're faced with okay, well, I can get a free report done by a foundation repair company, or I have to spend a thousand dollars with an engineer. Uh, I think I'm going to save the thousand dollars. Well, that's a, that's a mistake because you're going to pay way more than a thousand in art upsells charges and other problems. And guess what? Five years down uh, and down the road, you might have another problem like, okay, the foundation repair industry, we give a lifetime warranty for our peers. And that ought to make you feel really good, right? Yeah. Yeah, it makes me feel really good. Well, then five years later, you call up and you say, hey, my house has got all these cracks and, you know, it's still got problems. So then they send out one of their really educated guys and he says, oh, well, yeah, this is from Heave. 
And it says right here in our contract that our peers can't fix heave and our contract uh, excludes it. So, well, have a nice life, you know? And the homeowner says, wait, wait, if it was heave, then you guys probably diagnosed it wrong. You know, you, you shouldn't have put in the peers in the first place. And then the contractor says, hey, what do we know? We're just dumb contractors. We're not engineers, you know? And and, and this is the problem you face when you hire a contractor that uh, to give you a plan that hasn't been engineered. Now, most co uh, contractors will tell you, oh, don't worry about it. When we get permits, we're going to get, we're going to get, uh, you know, engineering done. Well, guess what? That is not engineering that tells you uh, that, that this is what the problem is and this is the solution. The only, the only thing engineering that the cities require is a spacing calculation. They don't want the piers spaced too far apart so that the house will sink between the piers. That's the only thing the city requires. And most contractors are smart enough to know that well, that's gonna be six or eight feet depending on whether you have snow loads or not. Uh, and that's kind of the standard in the industry for most foundations. So it's kind of a dumb thing that that's the only thing they require because it's kind of intuitive. But the most important thing nobody asks for, uh, and that is what was the problem and what's the solution? Nobody, nobody asked that up front to get permits. And so when you get a permit, they're not going to discuss that problem. They're not going, and, and, and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to address it at all. So this, this promise of, oh, we're going to get engineering is a false promise to make you feel good, but does nothing to help solve the problem. And should I be worried when a seller is fixing it because they're going to take the lowest bid and try to save as much money? They may not. I mean, the, nobody's going to care as much about as the person who's buying the house, but they right. might be too late. And, and I see this a lot. I see this oh, well, the seller went out and got his contractor and the buyer went and got their contractor. There was a huge difference. Oh, now what, right? Again, it, it should go to an engineer. The engineer will decide. The engineer might just decide, hey, all you need to do is fix your drainage. That's all you need, you know? And, 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 and maybe the majority of time, that might be the only thing that you have to do. But in the end, you get the engineer stamp. And if you're if if you're a buyer and you're looking, you know, for the for the for the sellers, oh, we had we had work done. Well, guess what? I want to see the engineering plan. I want to see the sealed stamp by the by the engineer who investigated the problem, not the one who pulled the permits, the one who investigated the problem. Oh, and by the way, he should be the special inspector that goes over and ensures the job was done per his requirements and that he puts his seal on the end of it that says, yeah, this was done properly per my plan. Now you now the buyer has a total total confidence that uh, it's it's done right. And guess what? The engineers are are regulated by their state boards. So if they screw up, you can hold them accountable. Guess guess what? The foundation repair contractor sales guys who holds them accountable? Nobody. They could tell you the the moon is made of green cheese, and nobody cares. And engineers, they might not be in business. They might not be in business by the time you have to go out after them. It might not. But the fact of the matter is, it's difficult anyway. It's like going after a home builder. It's it's very difficult. I know. I was on the other end of it. Uh, it's hard to win those suits. Do all foundation repairs have to be permitted? So you should ask if that you should they should have a record of that. It should be permitted. Some states don't require it. And, and it's a shame it's kind of interesting, both coasts, east and west coast, uh, permitting is, you know, always required. Uh, you know, you would you would be in deep doo-doo if you did it without a permit. You get to the middle of the country, North Dakota, Omaha, uh, you know, Iowa, they don't require permits. You can just go do it. In, in, in Texas, you don't even have to have a contractor's license to do contracting work or foundation repairs. You can, anybody can just go do it. Now, I, know. I, I love Texas, Texas, but that scares the hell out of me because. Yeah, but... it's crazy. I mean, it's, you know, it's the uh, wild, wild west there in Texas. They they do a lot of cities in Texas, to their credit, do require an engineering report. And some of them require a full report that investigates the cause. Uh, not very many, but some of them do uh, because it's such a problem there. They The cities have learned to kind of deal with it. Uh, but most places around the center of the country uh, do not require permits. In, in Arizona, even, they didn't require it for a long time. 
And now it's finally uh, getting around to the point where uh, it's required. And sometimes it still happens without permits. But I would say 90% of, of the work is now permitted. Why do you think that is? Do, do people just not care enough? I mean, if you're buying a house, that's your biggest investment. Yeah. I would think you would want to know everything, but most people don't. Well, again, it comes to the sales guy. If the sales guy's really confident, you know, and he says, oh, you don't need permits for this. We do it all the time without permits. It, it's it's a non-permittable kind of thing. Uh, and besides, it's going to it's gonna delay your project. It's going to cost you more money. We can get this done right away and be a lot cheaper. And we're going to do a good job anyway. Uh, that's that's the you know that's what the sales guy says to the homeowner, and a lot of them buy it. Yeah, I think we're all stupid because we, we hear what we want to hear. We want the path yeah. of least resistance, but then when things go wrong and we got screwed, then we want to blame somebody, and people really <laughs> yeah. need to blame themselves. That's right. Yeah, after the fact, and you got problems, then you become very angry. But uh, you kind of did it to yourself. Wow. Well, listen, hey, Bob, you're so passionate about this. I can tell it. It, it shows that you love what you do. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wish you luck with the book and, and everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, I'm happy to be here. It was a lot of fun. If you have a story about your house, good or bad, I'd like to hear from you. There's a contact form in the show notes. Fill it out and send it my way. You might be a guest on an upcoming episode. Thanks for taking the time to listen today. I'll see you next time.